Hey everybody, it's Sam Culper from Forward Observer. We're in Waynesville, North Carolina at Heritage Life Skills Festival. I try to come here almost every year. It's my fourth or fifth year being here. And it's really great to see old friends, make new friends, and do what I especially love, which is talking about intelligence. And here we are at essentially a preparedness conference where people are preparing for maybe a collapse scenario, maybe some kind of systems disruption. The bottom line is that it doesn't matter what event you're preparing for, but the more complex the event, the more disrupted the event that you're preparing for, the more important real-time information becomes. The fact of the matter is that we need intelligence. We have to have situational awareness. If we don't have situational awareness, then we are susceptible to uh, strategic shock, which is being exploited by threats or by conditions or events that we couldn't foresee or that we didn't know existed or that we didn't understand were going to happen. The more information we have coming in during an emergency, the better decisions we'll be able to make. That really is the bottom line of intelligence. So the more complex the scenario, the more fast paced the scenario you're planning for, whatever you envision is going to happen in the future. Make sure that you leave a role there for intelligence. So I'm reading a few books here. Actually, before I get to that, I just talked to, I had this great conversation this morning at breakfast with Forrest Garvin. And Forrest is from, he runs a, a site called PrepperNet. And, you know, he says, uh, it's not sarcastically, but he says, if you're not a member of a prepper group, you're gonna die, right? And so that's kind of tongue in cheek, but he has a very good point because tribe matters. Being a member of a group matters. Also, Franklin Horton was there this morning. He's a, a prepper fiction author, and we were talking about how important it is to be a member of a community. Um, people who are in very secluded areas, they have no one to help them. No one's gonna come save them. They, you know, you can't see your neighbors. You're not a member of a community, you're not a member of a tribe. You're very susceptible to, uh, to some kind of attack if that's the scenario that you're planning for. And so I'm reading a couple books that, and they kind of fit into this. The first one is called Why Nations Fail. It's a fantastic book. It's written by a couple of leftist academics, but they raise a lot of good points. One of the trends that they found in Why Nations Fail is what they call extractive economies. And that's when the state, like the Soviet Union or Zimbabwe, uh, or, you know, when they begin taking money out of the economy to fund state operations, you they de-incentivize work and they de-incentivize production. And so they take the money away from the producers, they take the money away from the people who are producing this stuff, and you know that eventually leads to economic stagnation. They and they give plenty of examples of, of uh, why that is the case and where that's happened. And really I think once the Democrats get back into power, that's exactly what we're looking at. A much more extractive economy. And then the other thing is a book that I, I just started called The Fractured Republic. And the fact, or, fact of the matter is, is that uh, these studies have shown that, that we are becoming more fractured. We are becoming, um, actually it was a, was it a, I think it was a Pew poll uh, that showed that the left is moving over the past 20 years, the left has moved farther to the left and the right has moved farther to the right. And so what we used to have is quite a bit of crossover. And now what we have looks more like this where there's, there's more people on the extreme left and also more people on the extreme right. And that's, that's a recipe for, for conflict. And you know, stuff we're already seeing, not just racial, but you know, class conflict, political and ideological conflict as well. So we may not be looking at a collapse scenario, maybe, maybe we will be, but I think what's more likely is that things are just gonna be very rough for the next at least five to 10, if not 20 years. Uh, economically you know there's there's really three trends that feed into this this is the last thing I'll mention there's three three major trends number one there's a hundred eighty three trillion dollar federal budget deficit over the next 30 years those are those unfunded liabilities we're talking about hundred and eighty three trillion dollars we're looking at higher taxes we're looking at reduced payouts for benefits um, and probably a lot of money printing and so economically it's going to be very very difficult for us and I, sh I should also say fiscally and that's not even to mention the state governments. Now, also what's happening on the global level is this shift from the unipolar world to a multipolar world. So the United States is gonna uh, have, more than likely gonna have reduced influence. Reduced influence uh, 
financially, economically, culturally, as more and more countries begin to do more business with China and less business with the United States, or they start to put more investment in China and less investment in the United States. So that's going to have some negative effects for the U.S. economy and especially for the U.S. dollar. And I think a lot of people go overboard about the decline of the dollar. I think it's much more likely to be uh, a long trajectory where things get get uh, incrementally worse uh, than incrementally better. And uh, I also don't expect a sharp, sudden dip, you know, like the dollar, we wake up and the dollar's worthless one day. I don't think that's going to happen, but on a longer trend line, that, that's exactly what's happening. It's just a lot slower than most people, I think, are, are predicting. Um, and then the third thing is, we're going through a generational change. You know, the United States has un undoubtedly become more liberal over the past, well, you know, over the past, you know, 200 whatever years. And... This generational change is eventually going to mean political realignment. And so the question is, is how do Americans react to austerity, to lower economic growth, to worse financial opportunity, especially considering AI? You know, Andrew Yang had this great um, interview a few weeks ago, and he was saying that trucking is the most common job in 29 states. There's like three or four million jobs. The average age of the trucker is 45. He's 45, he's too old um, to be reskilled, and he's too young to retire. So what are these millions of people going to do? And as, in the next five to 10 years, as artificial intelligence and, and machine learning become more commonplace, especially during a recession, if business owners figure out, hey, we don't have to hire Susan and Robert back, we can just build you know, an AI platform that will do most of their work. So you know, really, we're looking at kind of economic threats in that scenario as well. That's going to impact um, young people predominantly, low-skilled workers predominantly, right? because that's what AI is going to be able to accomplish in the beginning. And so high youth unemployment, we can look at the Arab Spring. I was just reading a, a paper the other day about the, the civil war in the Ivory Coast. And basically what happened is they gained their, the Ivory Coast gained their independence from, uh, from France. And they had this essentially a benevolent dictator um, who was using oil profits to pay off the three major ethnic groups there. Well, he died, and then oil prices dipped down, and so no one was able to pay to keep the peace anymore. And so all of a sudden, these three ethnic groups went at it, and there was a series of coups for who was going to be in control of the country. So my point, my point is, these two books really do a very good job of explaining what's what's occurring right now in the United States, which is we're going to have much worse problems in the future. And so I, I would just go again back to my, my original message is information matters. Timely information matters a whole lot more. We need information so we can make good decisions, so we can understand what's happening in our community, so that we can react to what's going on and hopefully stay out ahead of these events, understand what's happening in real time, and then we can improve our decision making and also improve our level of preparedness or our level of security Right? We're always going to be at a, at a disadvantage when it comes to time, resources, and manpower. We're not going to have enough of either three of those, or any of those, those three things. So prioritizing our time, resources, and manpower is going to be very important. In order to operate under the worst case scenario, we're going to have to be ruthlessly efficient with those three things. Intelligence allows us to do that. So uh, today I have one more class. I'm teaching a, another tactical intelligence class. It's an hour and a half long. And um, we, well, the wind, wind is picking up, the weather's about to move in, and I gotta go teach a class. So thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe this video, to this video. And if you have any questions about intelligence or you know what I see happening uh, in, in the future, please do let me know in the comments section, and I'll be sure to address those in future videos. Thanks, and until next time, stay out front.